Hi, so I am so excited to be here today to have a conversation with Diane Swank. So Diane right now is the Chief Economist at Grant Thornton. And as I do with every one of my guests, I want to explain how I was so privileged to get to know Diane. And at this point, it's hard to, so I, I definitely met Diane the first time and saw her speak at a National Association of Business Economics conference. And you know, you don't miss Diane, she's up on the stage commanding attention and in a space where there aren't a lot of other women up there commanding attention and saying like super smart things about everything in the economy. And since then, I've had a lot of opportunity to interact with Diane on Twitter and other kinds of meetups and events. And you know, it's always, it's really important to have role models and people you look up to and say, wow, they did it. Maybe after like 20 years, I can do it too. Uh, so I, Diane is definitely someone that I enjoy um, just learning a lot from. And I think another just, you know, to kind of set her on her heels with personal notes. Uh, one of the things that like I, I love about Diane, especially as she's on social media, on Twitter, uh, sharing her many pieces of wisdom about the economy is sharing about herself and making sure that we understand, like we're real, like every single one of us has uh, things that are really awesome and great about us and then things that are some more challenging parts. And so for me, knowing that that was part of my journey as a forecaster was learning that I have limits and I have, you know, health conditions that I have to be really careful about boundaries. It's really great to see somebody else that says, hey, I have limits too, and that's okay. And, uh, and also when the guys get you know, misbehaving on Twitter, she reminds them there are limits for them too. Um, so anyway, so I just, to me, that's been a really great part of like, you know, being an economist isn't just crunching numbers, it's also, you know, being a person. So with that big wind up, <laughs> and to why I'm so excited to have Diane here, what I had asked, what I wanted to do today was just give Diane a chance to, to tell us and share with us where, where her mind is in terms of like what, what's happening like in terms of the economy and to give the time stamp. So this is a Sunday afternoon, May 17th. I feel like every, you know, I should almost give you the hour exactly, but <laughs> it's been changing very fast. And so I know for any of us that do macro forecasts, it's kind of like the model is always running in our head and it's like, what's the next question? What's the thing that's changing? And so really Diane, I just, I want, I want to hear from you. What is it that you're like this afternoon mulling over in your head trying to figure out like what's happening right now where are we going and like what do, what do we do about it so. uh, that's a lot right there claudia and thank you so much <laughs> for that kind of introduction but you know um i guess one of the hardest things for me is first of all i've said this before but i think it's really worth repeating when i was forecasting during the height of the financial crisis it was like standing on a fault line i kept trying to find my balance trying to figure out what was going to happen next because it happened so rapidly this has been like forecasting in quicksand, just the breadth of the losses, the speed with which they've occurred and how disproportionately they've hit low income households. Those that are the most vulnerable, something that Fed Chairman Jay Powell has underscored and the new Fed survey, 40% of households earning 40,000 or less have had at least one job loss. I mean, this is stunning to see it and to see food lines for miles with cars stacked up. I mean, this is reminiscent of the pictures I saw as a kid of the Great Depression. And so, you know, that is, you're right, the timestamp matters because so much happens in a short period of time. And what we're seeing now, what I'm thinking about now is the dichotomy between how optimistic every scientist I talk out there is about the leaps and bounds we're doing between testing, tracing, tracking, isolation, some of the countries doing phenomenal jobs like, you know, South Korea in ways that we wouldn't necessarily accept if it happened here because they infringe upon personal rights. But, you know, the treatments that are coming out, I mean, as University of Chicago was testing different treatments, I was hearing about that from my friends that were working on that at University of Chicago labs, you know, so at their hospital. So, that's really exciting, but the difference between the timeline of a scientist that thinks this is so compressed, knowing that even the best, most aspirational case scenarios are a vaccine maybe by early 2021, which would be phenomenal. And um, to have enough doses, it's still highly, you know, we don't know what's gonna happen, but just thinking in those terms, the difference between that and what happens between now and then where we still have a highly contagious world, or we still have to social distance 
either by edict or by self-imposed. A lot of baby boomers are at that age where they're the most at risk. They account for a third of consumer spending in the US economy. They're already skittish. They pull back on their savings and bank their refinancing. This is the the generation that defined conspicuous consumption, I might add, but the conspicuous niche in consumption and was the first debt generation. They refinanced their mortgages since July and through February were raising the saving rate because they were banking the savings. So they're already skittish. So I look at that and I say, wow, the time between now and even the most aspirational, most optimistic scientific scenarios is an eternity for an economy. And that's horrific because what can happen between now and then in terms of the number of firm failures, just walking along my street, I see all of the, you know, the, the places that have closed and shut down and the, the paper bags literally on the windows, they're walled up with brown paper so that you can't see them anymore. Those are already gone. We think we've already lost at least 100,000 businesses and, you know, it's accelerating. So that leaves very little to rebound off of at the same time that millions of people have not gotten access to unemployment and benefits that they're eligible for and you know they're really stressed and so knowing that and knowing that social distancing is going to make it impossible for your average restaurant to clear a profit over the course of the summer and into the fall running at 25 or 50 percent capacity restaurants need 75 percent just to break even let alone you know pay their wait staff and cover all of their you know all of their overhead costs so this is going to need, we're going to need a lot more help from the federal government. And, you know, what I see as the silver lining is we have this foresight we've never had. During the financial crisis, it was looking into the abyss. We, this was metastasizing rapidly. We didn't know what was going to happen. We know there's going to be pain. So why not, you know, if COVID is the iceberg, instead of being the Titanic, why not get more lifeboats out there for both households and businesses and throw all your personal biases? I mean, I know a lot of people, we've talked about this, Claudia. Oh, they want to help households, but they want to help businesses. Well, there's no one, no one to employ if you don't keep the businesses afloat too. And we don't really have the luxury of picking who's worthwhile to save at this stage of the game. So to me, this argues all the more, the most optimistic scenarios put out by the White House argues all the more for more stimulus today and get something in the pipeline so we actually have an accelerant to have a better recovery once we do get a vaccine. Yeah, no, I think those are all really good point and tough, tough things to think about. One of the pieces, so I wanna stick on this word of optimism. So this is something, so the thing I've been mulling over when I was doing my Sunday morning walk, it's like, okay, am I getting just too dreary, right? Like I, I've kind of switched in my like rhetoric. To it's bias like, we all suffer from, right? Yeah, it's like, you know, I feel shell-shocked from, you know, 2008 and the recovery. So I found like with my language, as the unemployment rate keeps rising, that this is not, this isn't a severe recession. This is, this is depression that we are, we are either in or right on the edge of, in that we have, you know, like 25% unemployment right now, and we've seen price declines. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and so, but the piece that, and this goes back to the optimism, the piece where I get pushback, among other things, when I say depression, is that, well, but the thing about the Great Depression is it was this protracted, like for 10 years, such a slog, I was like, okay, like we're not 10 years into this, I get that. And then the, the comfort I'm supposed to take is, well, but Claudia, we learned from the Great Depression what we have to do to make sure that doesn't happen again. Like there were policy mistakes, like the Fed didn't do what it was supposed to, Congress didn't do what it was supposed to, and that's why it lasted so long, it was so painful. And I was like, well, this isn't really that comforting because I know, and the Federal Reserve knows, they can't do it on their own. So even if they've done a good job, and I think they've shown they've learned from lessons of even the Great Recession, let alone the Depression, but I said, I'm not convinced Congress has even learned their lessons from the Great Recession, right? Yeah. I mean, this idea that like, oh, let's wait and see, you know, deficit spending, like, I'm like, oh, oh my gosh, like, <laughs> you can't say that I mean, now. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting because, I mean, I was a deficit hawk my whole life. I met Jay Powell in the 2010 bipartisan, you know, mm -hmm. reduce the deficit panel, and there's just no reason not to spend right now. I mean, the alternative is just so devastating, which uh, Fed Chairman Jay Paul has also met, said. And, you know, it's not that you don't want to be optimistic. And, you know, there is, it is easy to go down a wormhole. And the problem is that's because if we don't, even though we've, we've seen this remarkable move of $3 trillion from, you know, the federal government, 
on a bipartisan basis in, since March 3rd to April. That's really a stunning period of time. The problem is they were still chasing a moving target. And it's still not enough given the extraordinary devastation. And this is something, you know, the Fed's begging on, you know, Jay Powell has gone out of his lane and said, we need fiscal policy. The Fed can lend, it cannot spend. We cannot do this alone. And we're doing, I mean, the Fed surprised me. I really thought they were much more limited than they were. And, you know, they pulled rabbits out of um, hats that I didn't think they were willing to do. And that's because this is such an extraordinary crisis. One of the other things that I spent a lot of time on and talking to people, and I'm sure you have to do this as well, is, you know, so many people want to put on those pre-COVID lenses and view the world as if, you know, through these moral hazard ideas, through these, you know, <laughs> What morality ideas through what they think is who's worthwhile to save when this really is like a meteor hitting the globe. It's not just the U.S., it's global in scope. There will be reputations throughout the globe that we'll feel in the U.S., and that makes it unique and requires all the more. So yes, great, we're responding policy-wise, but the idea that we're already getting fatigued and we're only this many months in, I mean, it seems like years, but the lockdowns, the economy, it's really important to remember this too is the behavioral aspects. I, I think it really upsets me when people blame, they sort of get causality mixed up. The economy <laughs> fell apart before we locked down one single state, before we shut down the school systems. The pullback between late February and early March was stunning. 870,000 jobs before we had the massive school closings, before we had want the, the state of California on March 19th go into its first shelter in place sort of rule. So the pullback we saw was behavioral and it happened in states that didn't lock down as well. Even those states that decided we're still open for business, we've got some kind of minor shelter in place things. They had the exact same behaviors. So the idea that you can just turn this back on and not have consequences and go back to the world we were in, the world that emerges from this will be similar but not the same. And we have to be really cognizant of how far do we want to preserve things on the other side that could still be businesses and how much do we let restructure today? I mean, in, in retail, the move from, you know, bricks and to clicks, bricks and mortar in store to online. This has moved that up two to four years as an accelerant. Can we afford to have all those retailers go bankrupt at the same time? We have to ask ourselves that. Yeah. Is that what we want? Um, or is there something on the other side of this, is there something to keeping travel and leisure and services, you know, supported in a way that once we do get to the other side of this, they can reopen and reoperate as they had. I mean, there's going to be changes, but, you know, to just make the decision, to not even think about that is giving away this extraordinary opportunity to do right instead of to have a much smaller, um, less dynamic economy that employs a lot fewer people and has a lot more problems. Right. No, there's so much I can say in response to this. I'll follow up on that very last point in that one of the things that equitable growth that we talk a lot about, that, you know, we have experts you know, from labor to tax rate to tax plus regulation is this idea of in the, we don't want to get back to February. Like February in a lot of ways is such a wonderful day. It's like three and a half percent unemployment, lowest in 50 years, 10 year expansion. I mean, that sounds really good. And I mean, like if we could, all we could do is get back to February, I'd be like, this is awesome. But February had a lot of problems. Yeah. Like, and, and one of the things that we see as like, and it's overwhelming. So as everything falls apart, we see that our social safety net in the United States from the jobless benefits to the foods, I mean, like everything was, it was inadequate. It was inadequate in February for the families who had lost their jobs or had, but now when it's like millions and millions of people, then we really notice because now it's like affecting everybody. So there's all these issues with the safety net. We have learned more about the food insecurity and problems with like, meat packing and processing. My dad, my, you know, four generation family hog farm, he's like, I've known this for decades, <laughs> you know, like that this problem was brewing, but it wasn't until like the whole system came under immense stress that we realized all these different problems. So then it's like, okay, if we want the re economy to recover, and this is something that we kind of talk about at work, and I have, you know, I kind of go back and forth because as a macro forecaster, I'm like, we are in free fall. Like, 
just, you know, if you can get $3 trillion thrown at this and, you know, go for it. Like we just have to keep, because we have to stop the bleeding. But there is also this aspect of, well, we might not recover if we don't try and fix some of the problems or, it, you know, put it in the way you said, it's like, let's reimagine. Like we're going to have, like there is going to be destruction if we are thoughtful about how we support. So it's not just complete, like the, it's just not really, really bad. Like it's going to be painful. What happened, what's happening and what will happen over the coming years will be painful, but it could also be productive in terms of what we do on the other side. It just feels like right now, I agree, like in a crisis when things are moving, there's will to like, well, every once in a while there's will to actually do something, you ought to use that. But it's also like the worst time to like really think deeply and quietly about like, what's the right thing to do? Well, and I mean, that brings up this issue, like you said, the crisis has laid bare all the problems that were already there and revealed. I mean, the idea that we have food insecurity where people run out of money for food in a week um, uh, in, in households that went from 15% pre, pre-crisis to 35% with households of kids under 18 in them. When you get to women-headed households, it's over 40%. I mean, from 15%. That's starving kids, you know, at the same time, they can't get an education fully if they don't have as much funding to get there or Wi-Fi to get access to their online classes. I mean, all of this, we've starved education for decades. Um, you know, I started out as an economist watching this happen and um, the shift, they call them unfunded mandates. They shifted in the 1980s where they cut taxes, but then they shift a lot of burdens to the states and then the states had to cut and um, or raise taxes. And in a very short period of time in the early 80s, the tax cuts that the Reagan administration had invoked were wiped out by tax increases at the state and local level because of the unfunded mandates. And I'm looking at this now and you know the residual of this has been enormous gaps in education. To think that before we hit the crisis, we had teachers going on strike because they couldn't get stuff for their kids in the classroom. They were only teaching four out of five days a week. Um, math teachers had to work two and three jobs to cover their costs, basic math. I mean, this is stunning to me, you know? And um, that was before we hit any of this. The, in the best economy in terms of unemployment rate we had ever seen, not the best wage growth we've ever seen, not the most even gains we've ever seen, but in terms of the unemployment rate that you had teachers begging and um, forced to go on strike because conditions were so bad, um, that is, you know, really, it gets to the larger issue. Now, do we solve all those problems right now? I actually think that might be a, a, a bridge too far to cross at this stage of the game because I'm so worried about the immediacy of where we're at. Ideally, in a perfect world, we would, we need transfers to states. That's a lesson of the Great Recession. We know for a fact that as the economy tried to ramp up, cuts at the state and local level held down employment. And it lasted for years into the recovery and dampened our employment and gave us a subpar um, expansion. So, you know, one of the lowest hanging fruits is to give money to state and local governments, which are on the front lines of this and have lost so much in just pure sales tax revenues alone, you know, that big drop in retail sales. Um, that's just sort of, to me, obvious. And, you know, you wanna play these games. I don't wanna bail out states that, you know, behave badly. Every single state is affected. One of the most vulnerable states out there, two of the most vulnerable are Texas and Florida, given the structure of their economies with the oil industry and with the service sector in Florida, they're gonna be hit for years. This is something they're gonna have a long time to have to recover from. So, you know, we need to get past that. So I'm not sure we can get to all the things you wanna to get to to make things more equitable, but if we don't, um, at least do this. And it would be ideal to have more training. I mean, we're talking about training and education in this economy for how long? I mean, you know, to have some kind of program, see people talking about reskilling. Yeah, people still need skills. We still need, that's been a, you know, we've, we've neglected it for 12 years, but actually for 40 years, we've let it chip away at it. And ideally to have something in there that also helps us get to that higher platform, but maybe doesn't solve everything, to me would be a really big start. Yeah. But we can't get any of this done if all the boats go down and nobody even has life jackets in covid tainted waters. Right. No, and I think to me, that's the way I've been thinking about this in terms of like what Congress needs to do right now 
And, yeah. and while the bill that passed the House on Friday is not perfect, like there are things that are missing, there are things that maybe shouldn't be in there, but it's $3 trillion and a trillion dollars for state and local governments. So I'm yeah. like, you know, just those, like the big number and states and state and local governments really have not gotten money. Like no. they, you know, there's like 500 billion allocated from the re re reimbursement for their PPE that they use themselves. I mean, it's, it's yeah, it's, yeah. It's so they just, really so the fact that like they absolutely have to have something. So it was in there and it's $3 trillion. So it's a lot of money. Again, it's going big. It, it is very, um, somewhere between uncertain to like not going to happen that that passes anytime soon. And to me, like what I would think is like pass that now, like let's get the free fall stopped. And then next year in January, whoever is back in Washington then, like who then it's gonna be clear that we have some serious cleanup to do. Yeah. And we just start thinking about that already, but then that is the time like on the other side of an election, like you just, but if we don't do something now to stop the free fall, right. that's what we're going to be doing in January. And it's gonna be twice as bad as if we just did something now. And that's where the whole um, wait and see rhetoric uh, it's, it's, it's deeply problematic. And I do think it goes back when I'm, when I'm being generous, I, I think some of this goes back to how, how optimistic should we be? Like I, I talk with a lot of macroeconomists, um, and there's many that kind of like, well, we're, we're at the bottom, right? Like we had to shut the economy down. It was all about shutting the economy down. And once we open it back up, yeah, we're going to, it's like going to be at the bottom, but we'll go up. And I'm like, you know, to your point about like, I, it wasn't, it was the massive amount of uncertainty about what was going to happen. It was, I mean, it was the stock market was the first thing in the United States that their late February and early March was telling us, Houston, we got a problem. And, and that's what you said. We saw the layoffs. We saw these things moving ahead of that. So it was like, there's just this, like, we don't understand this virus. It's killing people. It's happening in different countries. We don't, and like, we don't know what's going to happen. And like, we, in the economy so but to me like yeah some of that uncertainty is less and the stock market you know the fed really stepped in and stabilized all kinds of financial oh, yeah. markets so i think they're feeling relatively secure that they're going to get to the other side of this and we need them to but it's, on some fundamental level the uncertainty that the markets freaked out about in early march we still have that uncertainty like we still don't have a vaccine we still don't understand can you get this thing a second time we still don't and now people don't need to look at the stock ticker they just look around their house or out in their neighborhood and they they're confused right like this isn't a so to me like i don't see where saying you all can go out of your homes actually like gets it better and what i worry about and this is the whole like downward spiral of recessions. Like I spend a lot of time saying, yes, the, the cause of this recession was different. Yes, we have not seen the coronavirus, but every recession has its own cause. But once they get going, they have this dynamic that just pulls them down. And so like, I really do worry about the small business owners that have been hanging on, but they could really only hang on two months. Yeah, and it's it, going to be four months before they get revenues that look like anything that they could handle. And for the state and local governments that are hanging on, they're going to start, I mean, they've already, they already have tens July of thousands. Is their, you know, they, a lot of them start their, their fiscal year, July 1st. That's it. Yeah. So it's like all that's still coming. So I, I don't think, and I, you know, this is where I try and check myself and make sure I'm not being too pessimistic. And I really don't feel comfortable practically forecasting tomorrow, let alone two months from now. But I feel like I need to think through scenarios. Like, I, I don't know that, April, like April data were horrible. I think, you know, on just the whole spectrum, the unemployment rate is one I still can't wrap my head around and it's going to be higher in May, but like, I, I'm not sure that we're, we're done seeing the declines. Well, you know, it's interesting because you can also have, you know, sort of a big rapid increase that doesn't get you anywhere near operating level. And the idea, I'm worried about a setback again with the second wave in the fall. I'm worried about how tepid this ramp up could be and how many more casualties we have over the summer when so many companies are not even going to go back to their main workplace until the fall, if not until 2021. I mean, professional services firm like the one I work for, I can work from my house for the next two years. I mean, you know, the reality is that I can effectively do my job for quite a while. 
without getting out of my house. Now, I don't want to do that for the next two years, but um, you know, there is, this is fundamentally shifting business models. And I think one of the things that people aren't putting into this that um, was a difference, say a century ago when we had the 1918 flu pandemic, um, which was a very, very different time, is that now, much like 9-11, there's gonna be a permanent imprint of funds siphoned away from hedging against these kinds of disruptions that aren't going into fundamentally the foundation of our economy, investing in our economy. We're already a year into business investment contracting mm -hmm. through trade wars. We've had a year of contraction. So we've lost a year already. You add the uncertainty of this and siphoning funds into defense instead of offense on business strategy. And that does undermine your potential going forward you add to that that this is an accelerant to everything from retail restructuring, but also as we unlock inside of borders, we're gonna lock down borders more. Deglobalization, disintegration is gonna accelerate, which means restructuring supply chains. And the irony of all this is it was a global pandemic. It didn't matter where you had production. If you had it in the United States, you could have had mm -hmm. part of the United States close down at a different time than the other part of the United States. So, you know, the idea is we're gonna hedge against something that doesn't really give us a hedge. And there's sort of, it reminds me of all of the efforts we went into post 9-11. And it's not clear to me it's made the airports that much safer with all of what we go through um, to get to a plane. And I'm a person who's survivor of 9-11, which is one of the reasons of many I have PTSD. But, you know, having gone through it, yes, I want to feel safer, but there's a sort of a duck and tuck sort of mentality out there of the Cold War of, you know, um, actually when I was a kid, that's what we did. We ran into the hallways and a nuclear bomb's coming your way and, you know, get out of the way. <laughs> and, you know, I look at people, take, you know, the, the accuracy of temperatures being taken in factories, yes, it gets your worst COVID case already out, but they've already got it. It doesn't do anything about asymptomatic. And it doesn't even, I mean, there's different temperatures for different states on what they consider the temperatures should send you home at. And so there's no protocols. I look at all this and I say, we need some things. We have to remember this is happening also all over the world. Now, I give Germany a lot of credit too, because they went through this and handled it pretty good. And I just, saw online They're, they've already they've gotten people to buy pictures of themselves to put up in a stadium for the soccer players to play <laughs> and they're putting them so they're filling all the seats mm -hmm. and that's one way to raise money i'm like well the next thing they have to do is pipe in people cheering you know i mean they need to be able to <laughs> cheer simultaneously and i'm like wow how innovative is that you know mm -hmm. that there are ways to still work in a covid tainted world but because we don't have a national coordinated effort, because it's piecemeal across, across states, imagine if you're a company that's operating in different states and you've got to deal with all these different protocols. So all of this sort of adds weight. And it's when you start, and that's why we need this, these lifeboats right now, because it adds to your story of, could you get an easy setback? Sure you could. You don't even have to close mm -hmm. down again. You don't have to have mandatory close downs to get a setback or to get caught in a very low growth period as you ramp up and a sub, you know, where you're, you're operating at 50 to 60 percent of the economy's capacity. Um, some firms doing better than others, very unevenly distributed. And then you get a second wave in the fall and you have a recoil effect that's self-inflicted because of human behavior, because we get scared. And you know, that's, you need reassurances in place. And I worry that um, one, our culture and who we are as an agent, um, about individuals and privacy rights. Um, and also, you know, what's come up is, you know, that it's um, an assault to wear a face mask in public. I mean, I don't understand that. I mean, I'm someone who's high risk. My son's almost died seven times. He's got severe asthma. I've been in the emergency room with him. I know what it's like to, you know, hold a child that might die in your arms. And I can't understand that um, because, you know, um, I could lose him. So, to me, that's really mind boggling, but clearly we've not done enough on behavioral side of it to have people understand the, what, what if we really were working together, I think we'd have a better chance of avoiding some of these vicious circles, cycles and be able to function a little better um, yeah. opening, but um, that's not where we're at right now. Yeah. No, that's... I'm not helping you on your optimism very yeah, much. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> hey, I, I'm here for the real talk. I don't... Well, it's, you know, I think it's... 
what I appreciate and what I, I think and I hope everyone listening appreciates hearing from you is we are economists by training. You know, as I said at the very beginning, we bring our lived experience and like the things that we have, like that, that affects how we look at the world and the questions we ask. But you're, you're picking up information from, you know, listening to health professionals, listening to the business owners that you consult yeah. with, listening to, right? Because it's about putting all these pieces together because it's not like economics is just a set of like time series models or some no, kind of exactly. macroeconomic simulation. It's like, these are all these pieces and you got to figure out how to weave them together. One of the things that I was taught when I started the Federal Reserve, so 2008, started forecasting and I was... It's like you write down all these numbers and then we debate about them and, and there's these words like that you use for number. I don't know. Like it was all this very like confusing thing. And they were finally like, Claudia, you I worked on what they called the judgmental forecast. So we had models, but at the end of the day, the staff sat down and we'd have these very long forecast meetings and like exactly what we were gonna write, numbers, what we we're gonna say. And at some point they said, Well, it's like it's like storytelling. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't we're not going to fire you if you get a number wrong, um, because all the numbers are wrong. You know, right. Dave, Dave Stockton would go into Federal Open Market Committee meetings. I know Dave two, well. <laughs> yes, in 2008 and be like, you know, this forecast has the shelf life of mayonnaise in the Mojave Desert. I mean, like we just <laughs> knew, because again, it was a time where the world was changing very fast. But it's like we needed to write, we wrote a forecast down, not so that you had like 3.5 and 1.5% or whatever. It's that you had a consistent story of like... Right here's all this that's happening, we put it all together, and then we do something that is basically internally consistent, if, you know, and then you explain, like, you just, you, you distill it down to, you know, a 60-page document with 150 charts, and, um, and they said by, you know, so that was, it was like being a storyteller, you know, um, attached to data and like past experience, you know, the economy. But they said by the same token, like if you wrote the number down and it was right, is when the data release came out, that was what the Bureau of Economic Analysis said. It didn't really matter if like the story, like the reason, the mechanism behind it that we explained was totally wrong. Um, and so it was just, it's kind of an interesting, but I, when I li listen to people who are very good at real world macro, that are trying, like, I can hear that in the way you and others, like, the synthesize the data, because that's what you're doing, like, you're pulling all the pieces together and trying to, like, thread the narrative, and I think that's a, you know, well, anyway, so I enjoy listening to it, even if it isn't, like, you didn't find the happy thread I was hoping for, but, you know, this. It's, I, well, what's interesting to me, and this is what most people don't understand about economics, is we're trying to study collective human behavior. We're making an aggregate guess on how people in general are gonna react to something. And there's gonna be outliers in that. And the idea is, I mean, I started out, gosh, a long time ago, um, September 16th, 1985, walked in with a graduate degree from Michigan. Um, I was 23 years old and I started out on a trading floor, which I never ever wanted to do again. And I realized it didn't matter if I forecast a number right or wrong, if they had bet against me and the number was right, even if it was right for the right reasons, it didn't matter because they didn't make money because they bet against me. And I didn't like the lack of context. And I was taught something very applied and um, I needed context and everything needed context. And my one of my mentors once said to me, he said, you have a third eye, you can see things from a different perspective that you can see how to translate it. I've always thought my job was as an economic translator, trying to make the world seem real to people. And when you're working through these things, it sort of has to go through the, does it make sense? Does the story go together? And you know what's amazing to me is um, people's own personal biases do affect their forecasting. Um, and it's really hard to divorce yourself. And one of the hardest things to do is constantly ask yourself, where am I going to be wrong? And like you do, you know, where's the optimism? Where can I be surprised in the upside? Where can I be surprised in the downside? It's easier to go to the downside right now because we know all of those risks out there. But, you know, what if, you know, Washington had a kumbaya moment and, and a moment of clarity? I mean, kind of surprising. They've already had this moment of clarity with, with both sides working with each other. It's really been um, stunning how fast it is, even though they're chasing a moving target. Um, so it's still possible. 
that said, and, and science is, you know, technology is something that our forefathers didn't have. Our forefathers also didn't have the linkages and the connectivity with the whole world that went through this together. And when I say this is like a meteor hitting the earth off its orbit, it's not just us and figuring our situation out. It's what's going to happen everywhere else. And what does that mean for us? Can you imagine right now being an emerging market that's an island tourist economy? You're dead in the water, literally, for a long time. And you're going to fail. And that's not even the, the ones, the economies, the emerging markets that we've been worrying about. And to think that doesn't have a spillover effect on us, of course it does. It has a huge impact on us. And so I think that, you know, it's what, as an economist, you want to keep asking yourself, what is the reality? How does this make sense? What are the mechanisms? You know, thinking that, I mean, I just read something on Twitter where, um, uh, someone pointed out that some economists were so shocked that people didn't just use their their cash um, That you've been looking at how they're spending and they're spending on food their <laughs> cash rebates their checks not rebates their checks Why didn't they use it to buy cars? Because they can't afford food. I mean, you know, it was such a and it was such a bubble tenured, you know, sort of view of the world well everyone gets money and in theory, everyone's getting their unemployment insurance, even though they're not getting it in on time. That matters. It matters when we say, hey, you know, continuing unemployment claims aren't as high as they should be, which means people who've applied for them aren't getting their money. We know they've applied, but they're not getting their money. And now we're starting to figure that out by states who isn't getting, giving their money yet. I know in the state of Illinois, I talked to some independent contractors, the first check didn't come till May 11th. They've been no checks since mid-March. Yeah. They're, having a hard time. they're going to food banks, you know, and that's something that I, it just, you know, I, so I, I, I do think reality matters. I have the luxury of talking to people every day, everything from small businesses to Fortune 500 um, CEOs, but also, I mean, like I'm on a, I'm on an advisory board for a small business that may go under and the PPP loans and how they're structured, I know intimately because she's struggling to try to make this work in a lockdown economy. And she's got, I mean, she's not a restaurant. She can get, she's got a 30,000 square foot, she does art restoration and is one of the top in the country. It's a conservancy. And yet, you know, getting her employees back in 30,000 square feet where they're all gonna be one floor each and staggered over seven days, they were afraid to come back and they have, N90, they work with almost hazmat suits. They, they have all this protective gear. And then realizing that her money's going to run out, she couldn't get her people hired up fast enough with her PPP loan. She has to leave 150000 on the table, which may mean she have to consider bankruptcy as soon as June 15th. Wow. And that's, I mean, this was a business that was booming. And she's trying to do everything right. And because the government can't go back and course correct, which they need to on the pay, payroll protection plan loans, she can't make it. And so when I see things like that, it is hard to just divorce yourself from the reality of the people I'm talking to and the decisions they're having to make. Right. No, I think, yeah, I, I think this is probably a good, a good note to end the conversation on. So this idea that reality matters. So reality think, matters a lot. And, and we can't, I think, and you, we don't want to divorce ourselves from it. We do have to, like, for those of us thinking about the economy as a whole and positive, you do have to step back, right? It and and get some above the earth, yes. Picture. And and frankly, I mean, I have moments now, well, that you talked about that I just opened up our, we ran a survey, survey of consumers at Michigan on the rebate program. I got the micro data before this, I was looking through the file and some of the free responses and it's just like, this is so bad. Like, so there, there are times where I would really like to just shut the computer and, you know, go, go hang out with my kids and pretend, you know, like I, the reality is very, very difficult. Yes. Uh, I'm privileged that my reality, like off the clock is not like, it, it's really just fine. Right. But I know that for a lot of people, it's, it's really horrible. Um, anyway, so, but reality matters. So like we just, we have to accept what it is. We have to try and understand what it is, which is really hard when things are going a mile a minute. And then, you know, we, we talked about all the things that could go wrong, could go right, the policies, but I think this is, yeah. So 
You didn't make well, me feel a lot up. better, but you told me what I needed to hear because that really is, we just, we have to stay focused on what we're trying to do here and be helpful. It's, you know, and, and I, you know, what bridges can we build? What bridges won't be built? And we hope to bridge as many, build as many bridges as we can across these COVID tainted waters because we wanna make it to the other side and then we'll figure out who we're gonna be on the other side. In my ideal world, the ideal world doesn't exist. And I fear that we're gonna to allow too many people to not fit on those bridges and there's gonna to be too many losses. And you know, if you inhibit yourself too much, there's not as much to rebuild from. And that's why you also need stimulus on the other side of it as well. And you know, the good news is we aren't making the same policy mistakes as we are in the past, but we can always make new ones. And that's the bad news. <laughs> I don't yeah. want the new ones. I want us to learn from what we learned from the Great Recession. States need funding. Stop with the, you know, the, the moral hazard stuff and all of the, I know it's hard, it's an election year, but this is a crisis unlike any we've ever seen. And it should unite us, not divide us. Mm-hmm. Yes, fully agree. Well, thank you, Diane. I really appreciate you taking time this afternoon. So, so Absolutely. Great.